Okay, thank you, David. Well, thank you everyone, the attendees and the organizers for being here today in the Saturday morning. I know it's not easy to walk on a Saturday morning when there is very nice out weather out there and there is Malibu Beach very close to us. So thank you. And um, yeah, so we have been spending all this week working hard on the data products of James Webb. And I'm sure all of you are as excited as I am to work with James Webb data products. But today we're gonna to be focusing on the data products of this very special and unique instrument uh, telescope. That's the Hubble Space Telescope. And for me, Hubble is very unique because 32 years ago when Hubble was launched, nobody would ever expect that Hubble would be one of the pioneers in showing to us the atmosphere of other worlds. So I think, I hope you all take advantage and also enjoy this legacy that Hubble is leaving to us. And especially for you who are in starting the field of exoplanets atmospheres, I really strongly encourage you to look into the Hubble data products because it's gonna be particularly interesting when you look into what Hubble observed and what is James Webb observing and see if what James Webb is saying is agreeing or not agreeing at all what, with what Hubble saw. And a lot of these targets that uh, are here in the Excalibur data products are gonna have follow-up observations with the James Webb Observatory as well. So take advantage of that. All right, so let's start with this uh, overview of the Excalibur data products. So I'm gonna start with uh, going through some slides to present you the data products and feel free to use, to use your own laptop and go through the website together with me, if you prefer that way. And I, I know that some of you here are grad students or never worked with Hubble at all. I just want to give a very, very, very brief overview of what is uh, what are the Hubble instruments that have been mainly used for transit spectroscopy. And there are two of them. One is called STIS, and STIS cover part of the UV, the optical, and the beginning of the near infrared. And the other one is the WST3 instrument that we are presenting the data products to you today. And with WST3, you can see uh, the near infrared from 1.1 to 1.65 microns. And WST3, which is the green portion in this plot, in this transmission spectral plot, is the instrument that has been mostly used actually by the community, especially because you can see water and methane features. And now, of course, James Webb is complementing Hubble with a way more extended portion in the near infrared. And uh, the idea here is actually that we keep putting more uh, instruments from Hubble into this Excalibur uh, portal. And of course, uh, I've been working with the STIS portion that you see here. And if it's take too long for you to see STIS in the portal, you can blame myself. All right, so now let's move forward to the data products. So Mark quickly presents to you this cascade of algorithms that makes, that builds together the builds, uh, the Excalibur pipeline. And as you can see, there are many of them. Uh, the ones that are indicated by a red arrow are the ones that uh, we are releasing the portal uh, that you all can have access right now. But the idea of course is to make all these data products uh, public in the very near future. So we're gonna start through the very beginning at system.finalized uh, level. And, uh, oh, and, but before I go there, I just want to give a quick note on what these data products, uh, what the naming of this, lab, uh, the label of these data products means. So if you take, for example, this data.timing.hst, wc3, blah, blah, blah. So data is basically, it's the task that we use to produce the data product. Timing is the name of the algorithm. Uh, I my cursor is here, yeah. And HST, WC3, IR, G141, scan is the name of the observatory of the instrument, WC3, of the filter, G141, and of the mode, which is scan mode. All right, so going back to system.finalize of parameters. So if you click on this, uh, state vector, what you're gonna see is basically two tables, one that gives all the parameters of the star and the other one give all the parameters of the planet. So if, uh, let's say you choose the planet K218. So in the case, you're gonna put the name of the star here. The target name is gonna be the name of the star. So you put K218 and you're gonna see that there is the planet B and all the parameters of the planet B. And all these parameters are gonna be used later by our pipeline 
for example, to calculate the transit light curve and the light uh, and the, the modeling of the transit light curve and the modeling of the spectroscopy transit light curve and so on. So now we're gonna jump from system dot finalized dot parameters to data. So we got, you see here that there are multiple data algorithms. So there is data dot collect, data dot timing, data dot calibration. Let's start with data dot collect. So in data.collect, what you're going to see is basically the name of the instrument, uh, which is WC3, and the filter that was used. So WC3 has different filters, and with the different filters of WC3, you can access different portions of the wavelength. So as I said, G141, you cover from 1.1 to 1.65 microns. But there is other filters like G102 that were also used by the community, but not, not here today. And you can see here the number of frames of, you can also say exposures that were collected with that filter, with that instrument for the target K2A, K218. So now we're going to another algorithm, data.timing. If you click on data.timing, what you're gonna see here is more details about the observation that was collected. So, if you go in the first table, you see the different techniques that were used with this, this that could have been used uh, to observe the planet. So there are transit, eclipse, and phase cube. So you can see here how many visits were taken with each technique. And as you can see, there were many visits for the transit technique to do transmission spectroscopy, but no, no visits were assigned here. Uh, we didn't detect any visits assigned for eclipse or phase cube. And if you go to the bottom plot, this one here, you're gonna see uh, the number of visits that, uh, the that the observatory did to that target K218. So if you count these blue uh, lines, each of these blue lines here, you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there is nine visits. But when you look in the table, you must be wondering why there is 18. So you have double the visits. And the reason for that is because, as Mark mentioned, uh, WFC3 works with what it's called spatial scanning. And it's basically slowly moving the telescope. And while it's doing that, it's uh, the light of the stars spread along the dispersion of the wavelength axis. And this scan can be done in two ways. It can be a single scan or it can be a double scan. If you look in the bottom plot here, you see that each of these nine visits were done with double scan mode. So instead of count, counting as nine visits, we count the double because we treat each scan visit as an independent, uh, independent visit. And the reason for that is because these scans can be done in different directions. So they can be forward scans, reverse scans, and each of these scan directions, they have different systematics. So we treat them as independent visits. So in the end, instead of saying that there are nine visits to the object, we say that there are 18. And in the top plot here, this one that you see the frame separation per day is basically you're seeing again the nine visits and you see what is the interval in days between one visit and the other. All right, so now let's move to the last algorithm inside of data. So we're going to data.calibration. And in data.calibration, now you're gonna start seeing the, uh, the, the real images of the observation. So the first image here, you're seeing a spatial scan image. Uh, and do you see in the frame index 791, 791, uh, 91. And in the, as you can see, there are 808 exposures. So there are 808 images like that. Uh, but this is one of them, just as an example for you. Uh, and if you collapse this image in the scan axis. So basically, if you take the median of each column here, you can obtain the 1D spectra per exposure. So you have 808 exposures. So you can get one, you can get a, a single 1D spectra for each of these exposures. And that's what you see in the upper plot in the right. And if you calibrate this spectra, basically if you assign pixels to wavelength, you get your wavelength calibrated spectra. So you see the plot in the bottom here. And the reason it's changed here is because if you look in the y-axis, they have different units. One is terms of counts, the other one is terms of photons. Okay, and there are other three additional plots that you're gonna see when you, when you click in data.calibration. 
So one of them is basically the standard deviation of the residuals of these uh, spatial scan images. So basically, we see here that we are around two times the photo noise. Uh, and the other ones, uh, this dispersion is basically, so for those who are not familiar with the term dispersion, dispersion is the um, how much the wavelength uh, change per pixels. So you can see that in each, so each dot that you see in this plot is a different exposure. And again, I said to you that we have around 808 exposures. So you have basically 800 dots here, and you can see how much the dispersion change per exposure. And the last plot is the shift. So you can also see how much the spectrum change, uh, the position of the spectrum change in the detector per exposure. And you can see that there is a relative shift from one spectrum to the other in terms of the exposure. And of course, we need to quantify that when we're uh, calibrating the spectrum. All right, so now we're gonna move from data to transit. Transit is an order task, and inside of transit, you have also different algorithms. So there is transit.normalization, transit.spectrum, and transit.white light. So let's start with the normalization one. So when you click on this run ID of transit.normalization, what you're going to see is these different visits. And uh, basically, each color that you're seeing these plots are a different exposure. Again, we have 800 exposures, so you're going to see, uh, that's why you see so many different colors. And here is basically normalizing that 1D spectra, is normalizing this 1D spectra that you saw here, where you can start looking for some residues. And uh, here I put five visits, but we have about eight visits for this target. All right, so now let's move to transit.white light. And in transit.white light, you see the transit uh, white light cube. So to obtain this transit white light cube, you basically, you are taking that 1D spectra that you saw before and you are summing in the wavelength axis. So if you sum along all the wavelength axis, you obtain this white, nice white light curve here. And of course, again, each different color correspond to a different visits and we have eight of them. Okay, and finally, transit.spectrum. So basically in transit.spectrum, instead of you sum in all of the wavelength axis, you're gonna take wavelength beams. So you sum inside of each wavelength beam and you're gonna be taking like a, 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 a transit cube like that, but per wavelength. And when you do that, you can model and you can estimate the transit depth in each of that beam. And that gives you this trans, uh, the transmission spectrum that we have been seeing the whole week along with uh, James Webb. So uh, to remind you that with WC3, we are looking around 1.1 to 1.65 microns. And what you're seeing here is basically there are these two colors means that uh, the gray color here is the uh, few, few using the full resolution of WSC3, while if you beam the data, if you average some uh, uh, wavelength beam, uh, yeah, wavelength beams, you're going to be taking this beamed resolution in blue. Okay, and also when you click in this transit dot spectrum, you can see all the plots popping up. Uh, so you saw this nice plot that is the transmission spectrum, but you can also see the unmasked spectrum. That means that we flagged some of these wavelength channels. So you can see here that some points like this one, you don't see in the, in the original plot. And that's because we flagged, uh, because these channels, they're probably being rejected because the spectrum modulation is around five scale heights. Okay, so the final uh, algorithm that I'm gonna, I mean, task that I'm gonna show here is the Cerberus. And Cerberus is our atmospheric retrieval. So it gives a forward model and, the, and also the atmospheric retrieval. So if you click on Cerberus.release, what you're gonna see is the, again, the transmission spectra, you have the binet resolution blue, and now you have the most probable model that was uh, estimated with Cerberus. So you see in this, nice orange line here. And as you can see, there is something, some spectral modulation around 1.4, which is likely uh, indicative of water. And with Severus, you can obtain also the correlation plot uh, where you're gonna see uh, the posteriors of the atmospheric retrieval. And here you have some of them indicated. Uh, we have CTP is a cloud top pressure. So basically we put a cloud layer 
in our atmospheric model and below that cloud layer, you can see anything in the atmosphere. There are three haze parameters that are a, par a parameterization of the Jupiter haze profile. There is T, which is the temperature of your atmosphere, and you can compare how much is that uh, to the estimated equilibrium temperature of your planet, uh, metallicity and C2O. And I'm not going to go into the details of the atmospheric retrieval because Gael, who is sitting right there, is going to give us way more details about that right after me. Okay, so finally, um, these data, some of these data products that I just showed to you to, uh, a few seconds ago, like cerberus.release, system.finalize, transit.spectrum, and transit.whitelight. As you can see, they have these icons where you can download them, and you can also download them, uh, them using Azure Python Notebook, for example. And that's the tutorial I'm showing here today. So the tutorial is not to do data reduction, it's basically just to download these data products and you can do your own plot and work however you want with this data. So I'm gonna change to the notebook. So I'm just gonna briefly show to you. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> that's, that's great. Cause I was planning to do my presentation interactively going with the, all of you. Uh, through the portal, but when I prepare the slides, because we're afraid that there will be too many people accessing the portal at the same time. Okay, so okay, so if you want to open this notebook, uh, I think we can also yes, together with me, so we can. Oops, uh, it seems like okay, good. So the first cells is basically to import some of the Python package and set up the mat the plot. Uh, configuration, but if you go to this retrieve the Excalibur metadata, you're going to see here uh, that you're going to access the URL of the IPEC portal, and you can, of course, access directly. Uh, if you don't want to use the notebook, you can access directly this uh, URL yourself. Uh, but okay, so in the notebook, we are accessing that and we are putting this metadata inside of a dictionary. So when you print this dictionary, you can see here now all the targets that are in our database, the tasks that I just went through with you, the algorithms that are inside of these tasks and the instrument and also the future of the instrument that uh, we are using. So if you wanna see all the targets list of Excalibur, you can basically uh, select the, the column that's inside of this dictionary. So for example, you're gonna see the target column that's inside of the dictionary DF. And then you can print it and you see all the 78 targets of Excalibur. And you, of, you can choose your favorite one. So I, I chose my favorite, which is K218. So I, I put target equal to K218. And now we are gonna see uh, some of these algorithms products. So I chose data of system.finalize because I wanted to show to you how you can access the parameters of the planet and of the star that are inside of this state vector. So if you, change algorithm in the dictionary to finalize, you can access the parameters of the planet that are printed here, or you can access also the parameters of the stars as I printed here. And let's say you don't wanna work with a single target, you wanna see all the targets that have our specific data products. So if you wanna access all targets that have white light, for example, you can do that. So you can change the, you can access the algorithm that you are interested in in the dictionary. So let's say white light, and you can print here all the, all the targets that have uh, transit.whitelight. So you can see that there are 59 targets that have downloadable light curves and you can access them. But now going back to a single target, you can go back to your favorite one. I chose in the beginning K218, but you can change the target. Uh, and then we can uh, start, start accessing these specific uh, data products. So let's access the white light curve for this, for this target. So basically I select all the light curves for this target K218 and I store everything in a dictionary again. So again, you can access the dictionary and see all the keys that are inside of it. So there is planet, there are the number of visits to this target and all white and phase is basically it's gonna give you your raw white light curve and the posterior, the, the, one, the, the parameters that come from the white light model are stored in this post uh, blah, blah, blah. 
So all the posterior from the transit light curve model is stored here. So you can use that to plot the raw white light curve and also the model, which is this solid black line. And you can do that for all the eight visits of K218. And next, you, if you are interested in looking to the transit spectra, you can change the algorithm to spectrum. So now you can store everything that's inside transit.spectrum, again, a dictionary like I did for the white light curve. And you can print it and see what are in the keys. So you have your planet, which is planet B. ES is the spectra, the transit spectra, the transit depth, uh, which is basically the, the ratio of the planet radius with the planet, uh, the, the, the radius of the star. The arrows in the transit depth and WB is the wavelength. So you can use all these keys to plot the transmission spectra of K218b. And you can play with that because this is the full resolution, but you can also do your own binning. You can average some of these spectral channels and do your own binning as we did, as you can see the binning in the, um, in the IPEC portal. And finally is the atmospheric retrievals um, data products. So the atmospheric retrieval Severus. So now instead of using, now you're gonna go change again the, the dictionary algorithm to, to Severus. So if you go back here, you see Severus is the task, the algorithm is release. So you want to see release. So you change in the dictionary to algorithm release, as you see here, uh, and your targets are already selected is K218B and you download all the data products from Severus.release and store in a new dictionary. And again, you can access the keys. So you have planet, which is gonna be planet B. You have the atmospheric retrieval model, best model, which is stored in Atmos. And this glossary that you see here is basically uh, a description of what is the content that is in Atmos. So if you open a glossary in your dictionary, you're gonna see here uh, that in Atmos, you have the planet, oh, sorry, you have the planet here, which is planet name K uh, B, you have the wavelengths stored. Uh, this is stored in Atmos. There is the um, radius square. It's basically the, the ratio between the planetary radii and the star radii square. And the arrows in the transit depth and also the model, which is the atmospheric retrieval model. So you can select that, let's say, select Atmos that's in the key here. So let's go back here. There is the key Atmos. If you open this key, and you transpose because this is a, um, it's a table, you need to transpose that and you can access the model that's stored in this key. So now you can plot the transmission spectra that you obtain in the cell before in blue. And they will, now you can also plot your model that's stored in this key. So as you can see here. And basically that's it. If you have any doubts uh, about these data products, feel free to contact me. If you want more detail about how we process that, the data reduction itself, you can access these uh, papers that Mark uh, presented to you, but also feel free to contact Gael and Mark as well, because they also have a very depth, uh, very, they can go more deep into the details about the data processing to obtain this data. Especially the atmospheric retrieval, I would indicate Gael, and he's going to give a very nice introduction to all of you. Thank you. Okay, so as I as I warned in my talk, uh, we were successfully brought the service down. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Sorry about that. We, you know, this is one of the issues of always releasing, you know, a new service, um, uh, you know, and running through the bugs. And so, apologies. We'll get it up and running as soon as we can. It is the weekend, unfortunately, um, and so the person I've contacted may or may not see the message. Um, but you know, you take the notebook with you and work through this. And as Lisa indicated, you can always, you know, contact us, you know, later as you start to work through it. So, just apologies. It is part of the teething process of any new any new service. But having said that, uh, do you have any specific questions? Oh, sorry. Um, so let's start with a, I don't, um, do have okay, so this was an early question. I said, it says, why is the dispersion value low at the extreme left? It must've been in your presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and followed it up. Sorry, uh, I meant extreme right. He meant extreme right. Right. Yes. Yeah. What? Yes. Yeah. What? Right. I'll. Yes, I would like to do that. Yeah. So this is a this is a really interesting example uh, to consider. Uh, because it shows kind of what happens as we go through the processing. Uh, so here um, we see a couple of things. We see that the telescope, the frame-to-frame -frame pointing was not as stable. And it couples into the dispersion solution. Ooh, that doesn't look good. But another thing, can we go to the, um, uh, the view that showed how many visits there were for this thing? All right. Yeah, good. All right. So we also saw that there were 18 Excalibur visit numbers. Remember, an Excalibur visit is a unique combination of a HST visit and a scan direction. Okay. So it's nine HST visits and double scan, 18 total visits. All right. Wait for it. Can we go to the white light curve, please? Aha, eight visits, half the data was thrown out. So Excalibur is, as it goes through these stages, it's finding things like that problem in the dispersion. And these data are, they start to, they start to be thrown away. And so one of the things that um, we need to improve, and this is partly what you're gonna hear about from Kate, is the, the reporting on the classifier so you can get a little better visibility without being uh, an expert into what's happening in the pipeline. Um, and so there are, there are problems in some of the data, we get rid of them, at least that's the intent. Um, and so you can see here that, that there, there, uh, there are, you know, it's about half the visits. Uh, and if you poke around in the pipeline and you start comparing you know, how many visits, how many Excalibur visit labels do I see in the white light curve versus in the um, data dot timing? You'll see there are a lot of places where data is being thrown away for exactly that reason, because something was going on in the telescope pointing um, and that triggered, uh, triggered a data filter uh, and those data uh, were excluded from the analysis. So I, I, I'm really glad whoever asked that question. And this was a great place to kind of point out some of the filtering that's going on in the pipeline. And we are gonna get you better tools to visualize that um, uh, in due course, uh, but that's, that's what's going on. Thank you, Mark. Um, are there other questions for Risa? Are there any questions online, Ellen? Yeah, the, the notebook that Lisa was showing is, is available to download online. There was a question also earlier, are we gonna make the presentations available? Yes, we'll connect all those to the, to the agenda. Uh, oh, they're already there, okay. All right. Okay, I guess if there are no more questions, thank you very much so for that walkthrough. We really appreciate it. Let's give her a, oh, sorry, there's a question. Sorry, here, I'm coming, I'm coming. If I throw it at you, will you catch it? Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Raisa. So I'm a little bit confused because it's too much information, but let me see if I understand that. So all the data that I can use with Scalibur, it's already inside of the, the, the website. So I cannot, if for some reason I have something extra to my data, I cannot use Scalibur too. It's just like I cannot add external data from in the collab. What kind Not of kind of data are you talking about? I, I know I is uh, um, uh, it's a uh, a question for the future because I don't have any data to put there right now. But um, for some reason I have I don't know some extra point to put in some spectra. I don't know something like that. Oh, so like if you want to use another instrument spectra and merge with the Excalibur spectra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like kind that? of uh, a complementary data, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but that uh, enters in the same thing that I already have in Excalibur. I don't know, like, I know that you told me that you don't get, you cannot put test data uh, on there just for the Hubble, mm -hmm. but I don't know if you have some extra to put there inside and use together, just like Picasso does, you know, mm -hmm. you yeah. can do that. 
So basically, if you want to merge all the instruments, a data set with the Excalibur data set, I would be very careful with that because there are offsets between instruments. So even inside of Hubble, we have two instruments, STs and WST3, and we have been struggling with the, finding the proper offset to merge these different instruments. And now with James Webb, you also have many other instruments that you also gonna find the same issue that you're seeing with Hubble. What is the proper offset to measure one spectra from, from the, to measure, measure two spectra that come from different instruments. And the reason for that is because different instruments, they have different systematics. So you, what the offset that you are seeing, you don't, you don't know, might, it might introduce something that creates a fake slope, for example, you know? So you need to be very, very careful when you're measuring different instruments. Of course, you can use the Excalibur spectra that you're seeing with Hubble and uh, complement with uh, other spectra, you can do that, but you need to keep in mind that you need to be extra careful when you're measuring different instruments. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here with Excalibur is to provide to the community both WC3 and in the future add other instruments like STs and, and so on, Spitzer, other instruments as well. And we are being very careful in finding these offsets between the instruments. I have another question, can I ask? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> thank you for the answer. So uh, if hypothetically talking, uh, I ask time hobo and they get that for me for a proposal, I don't know. Can I use Colorboard or do I have to waiting for you to put that in the website? Uh, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, I just can use, only can use the data that's inside already. Or if I have some hobo data extra because of my proposal, can I use that too? How that yeah. works. So if you have like, if let's say you got a different instrument with Hubble and, uh, but the Excalibur purpose here is to do comparative planetology. That's why we have a sample of uh, 62 planets. So we are not really focusing doing, although we have some published publications for individual targets, the goal here is to do comparative planetology. So we have a, have a huge catalog with many planets as possible that have public uh, data set with Hubble. So if you get for individual target, uh, of course you can add that instrument. So let's say you get in the UV with Hubble and you're interested in, in putting the calibration in UV and Excalibur, of course you can collaborate, you're more than welcome to calibrate, uh, to collaborate with us and introduce uh, the calibration for all the Hubble's instruments as well. But the idea is to do that uh, for many planets that are possible, not only for a single target. So but you can, we're always very welcome. And Mark, if you want to say a few more words. Yeah, I, I understood your question a little differently. So I'm going to say it back to see if I got it right. Okay. I, I think you said, if I show up with some Hubble WFC3 targets that you've won through a competitive proposal and it's not public yet, uh, what do you do if you want Excalibur to reduce it? Um, Wasn't that question, but I like it that you go ahead, please. I'm sorry. That that was not the question, but I like the idea too. I haven't think about that yet, so please go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, my apologies uh, for no, my right. misunderstanding. Um, so the the uh, so the, if you were saying you're a PI of a Hubble program and you'd like your data run through the Excalibur pipeline prior to it being public, uh, that's something we could talk about. We're happy to support things like that in the community as uh, on a basis as we can. Um, and uh, uh, we have the ability to um, to decide what products we ship to the to the uh, IPAC portal. So we can reduce products locally, and they don't necessarily they don't have to go to the public portal. Um, uh, so that's something you know. Uh, I would just say reach out to to you know if that were a scenario you were interested in, you could reach out to either me or Haisa or other Excalibur team members you have a, a connection with and uh, discuss that. Um, in principle, it's not a lot of additional effort for WFC3 spatial scan. Thank you for your answer. I, I actually was better than I expect because I was thinking about that, but I'm gonna do that in the future. Maybe I have to talk with you. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Oop, sorry, one more question. You're never getting off the stage. <laughs> hey, the, this might actually be for any three of the last present presenters, but I saw in uh, your presentation uh, listed like stellar and planetary parameters and what their 
paper references were that those values were pulled from. Uh, I guess I was wondering how like you choose which paper to pull your value from and if those can be changed if you think that a better or a different paper has better or tighter constraints on some of those. Okay, this is a great question and it takes a long time to discuss. So I'd be happy to have that discussion with you at the break. Um, the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the short story for the catalog that we're releasing right now is that we tried to choose parameters at the time the catalog was being assembled, which was, you know, remember it started, it was basically being assemb assembled in 2020. We tried to choose parameters that were consistent with previous observations. Um, uh, in some cases, knowledge of the, the system parameters has improved substantially since then. And a really interesting question is what will that look like uh, when, the, uh, when the parameters are updated? And um, we intend to be able to give a quantitative answer to that in due course. Um, but in general, the, the, the business of choosing the right parameters is really, really, really tricky. Um, we have, uh, um, and we could have a, 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 I really invite conversations about that because it's, a, especially in large catalogs, this becomes a big deal. The only thing I would add to that is that that's one of the beauties of Excalibur is it tracks all of this so that you that you knew to ask that question, right? Here's the parameters that went with that that processing. So um, it's also, you know, we spend, from the Exoplanet Archive point of view, we spend a lot of time uh, kibitzing back and forth with Mark and his team about how do we improve what the Exoplanet Archive is doing so it can support things like Excalibur. And the number of times that I've gotten it, a phone call or an email from Mark of like, what the hell's going on here kind of question. Um, and, and it's all good, right? That's one of the things that's one of the things that the Exponent Archive is trying to support is this new generation of large field processing for a large number of targets. And how do you select the product pr pr parameters and all that kind of stuff, the mistakes that we make when we get stuff out of the literature, all that kind of stuff. Okay, are there any more questions?